behind me is the uh, present day National War College in Washington, D.C. In 1900, it was the, uh, the U.S. Army War College created uh, that particular year. And uh, the, work, the Army War College is, uh, uh, is important to uh, uh, this, uh, the, this lecture on military reforms, the dawn of the new century. Here are the terms and here are the learning objectives. By the end of this presentation, you should understand first the reasons for increased military preparedness in the early years of the 20th century, the importance of overseas possessions to the defense of the United States, the open door policy in the Far East, continued expansion of the Navy and the importance of the new dreadnought design to a battleship based fleet. The Marine Corps' new mission securing advanced bases for the Navy during wartime. Secretary of War Elihu Root's crucial role in Army reforms in the early years of the 20th century. The creation of a modern general staff system. And then finally, the changes in the National Guard that made, um, made it align with the new American defense policy. Here's a map of the United States and its possessions in 1900. And as you can see, uh, the United States had uh, acquired a significant overseas possessions, particularly during the recent Spanish-American uh, War. The main mission of the American Armed Forces remained the defense of the United States. But by 1900, it was recognized that the, the defense of the United States was going to need to, to take place sort of beyond uh, the borders of the continental United States, and particularly uh, in the, uh, well, the Pacific uh, Ocean uh, area would uh, require these uh, the use of these overseas possessions. Uh, the drive for military preparedness, beginning of the 20th century, was driven primarily by fears of that a great that the great power struggles uh, in the international uh, arena uh, increased the, the the risk of war and the possibility that the United States might find itself uh, caught up in those uh, in those wars, and then secondly, um, and this is the need the United States need to use armed forces uh, as a component of its diplomatic power to back up uh, American diplomacy, particularly in terms of the open door policy uh, in, uh, in China. The open door policy was a, a, a U.S. diplomatic initiative intended to, um, to assist American businesses access to the potentially lucrative uh, China market. And the United States found itself sort of competing with uh, Great Britain, France, uh, Germany, uh, and, uh, and Italy in terms of acquiring influence and acquiring a stake in that, uh, in that China market. The British, the French, the Germans, the Italians were doing this by means of sort of creating uh, coastal enclaves, which they controlled. The United States couldn't do that for both political and military uh, reasons. It wasn't viable. And so the open door policy uh, was a way by which the United States said, "Hey, let's let's you know rather than have enclaves and so forth, let, let's let's agree that everybody will have uh, access to trade with uh, with with China. It's important to all of us. Let's let's create an open door uh, for all people who desire to trade with uh, with China." So to back up this uh, this policy, the United States needed to have a certain modicum of uh, of military uh, strength to do it, and so. Part of the mission of the American Armed Forces, particularly the Navy, was to support this open door uh, policy. And then finally, uh, the Philippines, which had been acquired after the during or after the Spanish American War, during the Spanish American War, um, you know, it was important to the United States as a kind of a um, uh, a doorway into uh, into China. That was the main reason the United States annexed the Philippines. And once once it was acquired, it needed to be defended and and so one of the things that shaped uh, the American armed forces in terms of the policies uh, was 
you know, was driven by the need to uh, to defend the, the Philippines and the specific con you know security considerations that was involved with uh, with that. Now, the United States, you know, had already um, created uh, an expanded U.S. Navy that was centered on battleship fleet intended to, uh, as Alfred Thayer Mahan had wanted, to seize command of the seas, command of the oceans, and to, and to maintain that uh, that command of the oceans. And the United States had already built a number of, uh, of uh, battleships, and you can see uh, a number of them involved in this, the uh, uh, the voyage of the uh, of the Great White Fleet around the world, circa 1906. Uh, but these uh, battleships were becoming obsolescent, and with the commissioning of the uh, of the British um, battleship HMS Dreadnought in 1906, the the United States, uh, along with uh, other major naval powers found itself confronted by kind of a revolution uh, in naval technology. The HMS Dread Dreadnought was the first all big gun uh, battleship, really for the first modern battleship. And it was faster than other battleships. It was more heavily armored and it had 10 12 inch guns, that is a 12 inch diameter uh, guns mounted in five uh, turrets. And, and these and you know and so these these ten guns were very large and capable of um, of, of hitting uh, enemy ships effectively uh, at a very great distance, really about the distance of uh, you know fifteen or twenty miles. The, the dreadnought was also heavily armored and therefore you know difficult for other battleships to uh, to defeat. And so from then on, um, all major naval powers had to scramble to create dreadnought type battleships. And the first of these um, that the United States uh, created was the USS South Carolina. By 1914, the United States had actually put into uh, into service 14 of these post dreadnought battle battleships. Now, the U.S. Marine Corps was became important as as a sort of adjunct to. Uh, uh, the naval policy during this period. The original mission of the Marine Corps, uh, like that of the, the, the Royal uh, Marine Corps on which it was modeled, was actually to provide sort of um, security uh, on board warships to give you know captains a chance, uh, captains of force with which they could put down particular uh, potential uh, mutinies and to uh, to assist uh, uh, the ship in battle and so forth. Well, this this role was really outmoded. Uh, by 1900, and so the Marine Corps found itself searching for uh, a new uh, mission. These are Marines in 1900 uh, involved in the international relief expedition to quell something called the Boxer Rebellion in China. I won't get into the Boxer Rebellion. What's worth noting is that this was um, a military component. The Marines were sort of a military component um, used in the in the open door policy in terms of facilitating the open door policy. So uh, the role of the Marines as a kind of a colonial infantry uh, force uh, became um, an important one during the early 20th century. You saw Marines forces uh, deployed in the in the uh, Caribbean in the uh, in the service of American uh, interests on Caribbean islands. But the, the, the mission that the Marine Corps uh, wanted was that of securing advanced bases, advanced forces bases, um, to assist the U.S. Navy in time of, of war. Despite the the overseas possessions that the United States had, it was felt that there weren't enough overseas pos possessions to really support uh, a U.S. Navy in wartime. And so temporary uh, bases were going to need to be acquired, and the Marines began to develop a doctrine and technologies and so forth that would enable them to seize and hold uh, for the Navy um, islands and so forth in the, um, uh, in particularly the Pacific Ocean. In wartime, this, uh, by, by the time World War II broke out, the Marines had already acquired a good deal of expertise in that and their, their role in terms of 
and seizing Pacific, uh, Pacific Islands and so forth was, was critical uh, to American success in the Pacific War, which is sort of a subset of, the, of World War uh, II. Now, shifting over to um, Army policy, in um, 1899, Elihu Root became uh, Secretary of, uh, of War. He was a brilliant uh, man. He took, he took control of the, Sec of, uh, of the War Department in the wake of the Spanish-American War, and he recognized that the performance of the U.S. Army had not been um, all that good during the Spanish-American War. Yes, the United States had won that war, and the Army had played a role in that, but really what was notable were the sort of you know, screw-ups in the army and, and an understanding that you know, things could have gone differently uh, and uh, adversely. So Root became interested in military uh, reforms and sort of really receptive to it when, you know, when army officers came to him and sort of su had suggestions about the kind of reforms that were necessary. One of them placed uh, in his hands a copy of uh, Emory Upton's The Military Policy of the United States. Um, which had been published in a kind of sort of maybe way, just sort of informally uh, being, the, the document was sort of being passed around among people interested in military reform. But Elihu Root caused the military policy of the United States to actually be published in 1904. Uh, he recognized uh, Emory Upton's attempts as, as sort of a, as he called it a voice, Upton's was a voice crying in the wilderness. And Root thought that a number of Upton's ideas were good ones, and he realized that the time had come to implement uh, as many of them as were possible in a democratic society. Now, one of the key ones, and this was something that Emory Upton had uh, had wanted. He um, had visited Europe in the wake of the span of the sorry the, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71, in which the Prussians um, had just thrashed uh, the, the French army. Uh, quite quickly, and the French army was up until that time considered to be the best in the world, and so it was really startling uh, that the Prussians had managed to defeat France so easily. <clears throat> and it was recognized that an important consideration of this was the, was the Prussian general staff after the unification of, of Germany, the German uh, general staff. Um, a British writer, Spencer Wilkinson, called it uh, the brain of an army, and for reasons that I won't get into, but are in for the common defense. Um, the, you know, the general staff seemed to be a crucial component in terms of effective uh, military conduct uh, in, uh, in a modern type of war. So the United States, you know, Elihu wanted to develop something like the, uh, the German general staff. And so as, um, as a kind of a, a measure intended to move toward this general staff system, uh, Elihu Root was instrumental in the creation of the U.S. Army War College in 1901, and although um, the general staff you know, bill had to be had to go through Congress, had to be legislated, you know that hadn't happened yet. Um, Root and others tried to sort of you know shoehorn into the Army War College as much of the role that a general staff would play um, uh, as possible. So one of the people sympathetic to the creation of the, of the modern general staff was an adjutant general. It's an important you know, staff officer in the Army, a guy named Henry C. Corbin. There's the Army War College uh, itself, same picture pretty much as, uh, as what's behind me. But there were opponents uh, of the creation of a general staff. One of the keys to a, a general staff is that you would get rid of, of the commanding a general of the army in favor of a chief of staff of the army. And the problem with the com with a commanding general of the army was to whom did uh, this commanding general report? Did he report to the secretary of war or did he report to the president of the United States? And another thing about the commanding general uh, uh, that that arranged that arrangement was that you know this 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 general because of the ambiguity in terms of who he reported to. Um, had a sort of a, you know, kind of a significant degree of sort of de facto independence. Uh, and commanding generals like Lieutenant General Nelson A. Miles uh, liked 
you know, being a commanding general and resisted the idea of moving to a, a chief of staff system because, you know, they saw the, the role of the commanding general would be decreased. Another opponent of reform was a guy named F.C. Ainsworth, and he was the chief of the record and pension office, which sounds like, you know, well, why should anybody care about it? Well, a, a significant role um, for congressmen after the American Civil War was to help veterans uh, secure pensions and the widows of veterans secure pensions and so on. And, and a prerequisite for that was to, uh, to demonstrate, you know, that, that uh, you know, the person making the claim for a pension had actually served in the Union Army. And this took a long time because of the sort of a, the messy condition of uh, Army uh, records. Well, Ainsworth came in and he rationalized that um, that system into what was called a compiled service record that took the uh, the amount of time it required to sort of you know locate military records for each veteran from a matter of months to a matter of of hours, and so congressmen who was part of their constituent services were trying to help these veterans just loved Ainsworth because you know. A veteran could, you know, could come to the to the uh, congressman and request help and so forth, and within a matter of hours, um, you know, uh, this this help could be uh, could be accomplished. So the congressman just put in the request. A few hours later, it was granted. They could write back to the veteran. You know, you got your you got your pension. And of course, you know, this was a great vote getter because there are a lot of a lot of veterans. So Ainsworth, uh, by dint of this sort of great service to congressmen, acquired a tremendous amount of political influence informal political influence in the Congress. And since it was going to require legislation to create um, a, a, a general staff, uh, Ainsworth was really good at sort of lobbying against it and preserving the status quo. So it wasn't easy to get this general staff uh, created. But uh, a general staff was uh, created. And so sort of the general staff bill went, went through, but it still took time. Uh, for the now Army general, general um, chief of, chiefs of staff to really get on board with uh, with the new mission, and and there were still forces that were trying to sort of hobble uh, the general staff and the, and the chief of staff system as much as possible, and it was not really until about 1910 1911 uh, that uh, uh, the, the chief of staff system and the general staff and so forth gets you know gets uh, entrenched. Uh, you know, uh, in a sort of permanent fu and, and functional way. And the two key uh, people involved with this was the Secretary of War at this time, Henry Stimson, who, by the way, would serve as Secretary of War again during the Second World War. And then General Len Leonard Wood, who was Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army and didn't chafe at that role, but would rather completely agree with it and cooperated cordially with Stimson. And they sort of, you know, they they sort of set the precedent for the, um, uh, the chief of staff, staff system uh, as it would proceed thereafter. Now we can shift now to manpower reform. And the first thing to, to think about in terms of manpower reform is to go back to George Washington's sentiments on a peace establishment back way back in 1783. And what, what Washington wanted was a small standing army, a military academy, arsenals and armories, and a federal select militia. Well, you know, by 1900, all the first three had been achieved. And in addition to the military academy, there were other schools, advanced schools, the command and general staff college, um, whereby officers could, be, could receive a kind of advanced military uh, education. But the one piece that was missing was a federal select uh, militia. And what's important here is not to have a, you know, a literal federal select militia as to have a, a reserve force that could function uh, effectively in combat as, um, as a reinforcement to the standing army to sort of expand the, the army to the, the numbers that it needed to be in time of, of war. Um, the militia system, you know, had never worked very well before, the, even before the Civil War, it was, it was essentially moribund. Um, states had resisted uh, the creation of a, of a, of a select militia. And so, so having volunteer troops or reserve troops that could really expand the army in wartime, that was a that remained a real problem. 
if you look at the regular army strength in 1901, it had an authorized strength of 89,000 officers and men, which is really um, not very big compared to the, the size of European armies, certainly. Uh, and in practice, the, the regular army wasn't even that, uh, that large. So you needed to have a large reserve force, but the question was, how should it be organized? The Prussians and the German, or the, you know, and then later the Germans had created a conscription system where um, by uh, every, every young man uh, in Germany had to serve in the military for a couple of years and then served in the reserves uh, for, for more years and so forth. Really, um, it was a really quite, uh, quite a good system in terms of mobilizing uh, manpower for, for operations in, in war, but it wasn't, it just was not suited to a democracy like the United States. So you couldn't do that. So therefore you were going to have to rely upon the National Guard. Now, the National Guard uh, before 1900 had sort of been divided into sort of camps. There were some National Guard units of, where, you know, where their main mission was just kind of get together uh, and 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 sort of be military. It's kind of like a, I don't know, sort of a, you know, a military version of the Moose Lodge. They really did. They really didn't didn't practice for war, whatever. Uh, and then you had units that were interested in law and order missions, like breaking strikes or quelling riots, that kind of a thing. They were oriented toward that. And then the third one were people who were interested um, in uh, training for. Uh, you know, for warfare, these reservists for war units. Now, the National Guard Association of the United States, created in 1878, was a lobbying group, and it preferred the reservists for war mission. And it wasn't able to achieve a lot of uh, a lot of reform at the state level. So, the association turned to the federal government uh, for help, and the the government um, obliged by providing federal funding expanded federal funding uh, for National Guard units, provided that they followed um, regular army guidelines for, for military effectiveness. So that, you know, the kind of training and organization and so forth that the, uh, the U.S. Army preferred. So, uh, and, you know, I think it was that the U.S. Army military reformers didn't particularly like the National Guard per se. It wasn't they had anything against, you know, patriotic Americans wanting to serve their country. But the National Guard was, in legal terms, a militia force. And there were real problems with the idea of deploying this militia force beyond the boundaries of the states. And yet, overall, American defense policy was predicated on defending the United States beyond uh, the borders of the continental United States, as we've seen. So the National Guard had to be, the legal basis of the National Guard had to be changed uh, if it was going to provide this, uh, uh, this role effectively. Before going on to that, I just want to share something with you uh, right quick. This is a bit of a di digression, but it has to do with the National Guard. It has to do with the Ohio State University. So let's take a look. This is the National Guard armory that existed uh, at Ohio State between 1898 and 1959, and it was up uh, up close to uh, 15th An Avenue and, uh, and High Street. There was a fire in 1958, sort of gutted the building, and it was finally torn down in 1959. But when you go take a look at the Wexner Center for the Arts, which is on the same site uh, as the armor, the uh, uh, the architect was intrigued by the fact that a National Guard armory had once been on the site of the Wexner Center, and he incorporated um, a kind of a kind of an echo of the uh, the army's architecture in the creation of the Wexner uh, Center. And so, when you see the sort of the distinctive um, uh, you know, brickwork, the brick uh, the brick tower, and then and some other brickwork, that's supposed to echo. Uh, the, the, the guard armory that was once on that particular site. Okay, now in terms of manpower reform, the National Guard level, the crucial one is the Militia Act of 1903, um, called the Dick Act, 
uh, after Charles W. Dick, a Republican uh, congressman in Ohio, what this did was, it, it, as I've said, it exchanged federal dollars and equipment uh, for uh, increased U.S. Army control of the National Guard in terms of training and organization. It also created something called the National Guard Bureau. Then, uh, in 1908, the Militia Act of 1908, that allowed National Guard uh, units to legally um, get involved in uh, expeditions uh, overseas as units, okay, rather than as individual replacements for uh, regular army officers. So this, uh, these two acts uh, really reshaped the National Guard into a, a force that could support American military policy during the early 20th century. And this, this role for the National Guard is very important. I'm not sure that, that, that many people, or many civilians are aware of this, but the National Guard uh, far outnumbers the, uh, the regular army today, the active uh, army today. And this was the, the same was true during the Second World War. And so um, during, uh, in, in, in all major campaigns uh, of the Second World War in which the United States fought, National Guard divisions uh, were, were present and were critical uh, to American success. Uh, the Ohio 37th Infantry Division fought in the, in the Pacific um, uh, Theater. And then in the European Theater, uh, the 29th Infantry Division, I've got it here, um, fought alongside the 1st Infantry Division um, to secure Omaha Beach on, uh, on D-Day, the, uh, uh, the invasion of, uh, of Normandy during the Second World, World War. So those, those seemingly arcane uh, acts, the, 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 the Dick Act of 1903 and the Militia Act of 1908 were really crucial to um, uh, future American battlefield success. And uh, indeed, the, the reforms that I've just gone through were you know, really um, reshaped American military policy, army policy, Navy policy, and, and put it in a condition uh, that would allow for effective um, American armed forces during the 20th century. That's all I've got. So uh, I hope this was uh, this was helpful. And uh, take care.